Will you be remembered after you're dead? The Zedless Deadless podcast about obscure people from history with me, Izzy Lawrence. Hello and welcome back to the Zedless Deadless. I say welcome back because I was hoping this year to be able to do a couple of episodes a month and uh, I have not factored in the fact that I am a bit overwrought with the amount of stuff that I'm doing so uh, I basically work's got on top of me but you can catch up with other things I'm doing you can go and listen to the British Museum member cast that comes out once a month you can also listen to the latest um, series of making history which will be out later on this month as well um, if you want to find out about all of these things you should um, like me on Facebook when I say like me like the Z list dead list and I will update that follow me on Twitter I'm at ISZI under L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E, and I will drop all of the all of the things. And if you just like me being silly, you might want to. I do do a weekly podcast called Seti Sopo, which is a podcast about obscure people from his. No, it's not. That's what this one is. Oh my goodness, I'm tired, guys. Seti Sopo is about me and my friend Simon trying to find the opposite of things that don't have an actual opposite. So, what is the opposite of the Simpsons? It's the Smurfs. What is the opposite of motorways it's taramasalata they don't all make sense it's a good bit of fun so um enjoy that if you're missing me and of course you're missing me i'm sorry uh, i have got a really lovely episode for you now you might remember back in series one Whoa. I interviewed a man called Irving Finkel. Now, he's at the British Museum, and he's one of the curators there. And he's an expert in cuneiform, he's an expert in ancient Mesopotamian board games, and he's an expert in, like, Noah's Ark, basically. The, he actually built Noah's Ark, like, genuinely. He wrote a book about it. It's amazing. I, I got him to do the Zedless Deadlist live at the show. Um, he was on the same show as Robin Ince, who went on a bit of a wander in terms of his talk. It was very good, but his talk was very, um, yes, it started off in one place and ended up completely in a different place. But uh, Irving, I believe, mentions this, so I thought I'd make that clear, what he's on about. But anyway, so I was kind of thinking, oh, Irving Finkel's going to pick somebody really obscure from ancient Mesopotamia. No, he picked a Victorian vicar. However, not just any Victorian vicar. I, I really want you to um, enjoy this. One, it's got a brilliant last name, Hinks, spelt H-I-N-C-K-S. Hinks, that's a good name. If your last name is Hinks, wow, well done. And Irving, I want you to imagine Professor Flitwick as he's written in the books. It's basically what you have to think of. Uh, he's just, you know, you meet Irving Finkel and you're thinking, well, you're a real person. And he is a real person and he is genuine and he is lovely and he's incredibly passionate about history and just a really fascinating man uh, and a bit too clever for his own good, if you ask me. I mean, nobody needs to be that clever because, you know, he can read cuneiform, he can read ancient languages and he's going to be talking about a man who deciphered ancient languages, which if you want to imagine... We've had, you know, people on the Z list, Dead list who are code breakers trying to break codes, just trying to get to the bottom of, you know, finding a bit of ancient language and trying to break that code. I just, my brain doesn't work that way. I can barely do a crossword. Anyway, enjoy. In many ways, he is your ultimate historian, him actually having, you know, credentials. Will you please give a mass round of applause to Irvin Finkel! <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about Edward Hinks. He was a card-carrying fucking genius. (laughs) Now, everybody uses the word genius. For example, in our house, the person who makes the internet work when it doesn't work is a genius. The person who opens a sardine tin without losing a finger is a genius. But this guy was a real fucking genius. And you will never see a photograph of a better genius than this, so look carefully. He had a mind like you would hardly ever be able to find in this country again. For example, he had a giant intellect. He had vision. He had a sort of sympathy, a kind of fierce, ferocious determination. He had in spades all the qualities that nobody ever gets from the British education system. (laughs) And he was born in Northern Ireland. And by the time I finished, you are never going to forget his name. 
Edward Hinks, H, what was it, H-I-N-C-K-S. Now, the thing about him was he went to Trinity College, Dublin, and while he was there, he discovered in one of the collections in one of the rooms some Egyptian papyri. And he thought, hmm, looks rather interesting. Oh, I forgot to tell you that as his earlier career, uh, as I mentioned before, he is in history the first person known to have given it, started a joke off with the expression, the man goes into a pub. <laughs> but the trouble is that the historical resources dry up at that very moment and we never found out what happened next. So <laughs> this is very frustrating. Anyway, when he was at Trinity College, he saw these papyri lying around and thought, this looks like a rather interesting challenge. I'll have a look at this. And he knew that there was some clown in France who was pretending to decipher hieroglyphs first. So he thought he would look into it and see what he could do. And he did a very great deal indeed, in between writing papers about physics of light and other philosophical issues, and then Rawlinson, the rogue Rawlinson, who we will discuss later, had got hold of copies of old Persian cuneiform inscriptions, and he couldn't understand them from one end of the road to the other, and of course Hinks decided we'll have a look at old Persian as well, and he was the first person in the history of the world to understand how old Persian cuneiform worked. Now look, these people, what they call stand-up comedians, every time they make a statement, they wait, and you have to make a fucking noise. This is really important stuff. This is not right yet. Thank you. He was the person who realised that old Persian cuneiform was not an alphabet, but a syllabary. Yes! And he didn't stop there, because he found Egyptian a little troublesome. And so he decided he would have a look at the other kind of cuneiform, the one written by the Babylonians, to see if it would be helpful. And he is the man who deciphered Babylonian cuneiform for the first time. He did something unbelievable, and this is what it was. When the Babylonians wrote, they had signs, okay? And they wrote them along the line in order, but all of them meant more than one thing at the same time. So the early decipherers went down all sorts of understandable sort of false starts and dead ends, and this Hinks never did that. He had some kind of bearing inside him where he never went off at a tangent, like Robin, for example. He, <laughs> he really, oh sorry, he really had this innate sense of where pressure, so to speak, should be applied. So. In my view, he's worth some attention. That is what he looks like in the rosy-cheeked, um, enthusiastic, full flush of manhood <laughs> in Trinity College Dublin's portrait. But I thought if I started off with that, you'd go to sleep immediately. So, <laughs> Now, I have to talk to you about him. This is Sir Henry Creswick Rawlinson, who is the man, according to history books and pub quizzes, who actually deciphered cuneiform from Babylonia for the first time. This is Rawlinson as a fresh-faced young pillock, um, <laughs> starting heroically on his work, and this is him three days later. <laughs> um, the thing about this is, the sad thing about this is, that when Rawlinson was in his dotage like that, some journalists tracked him down in his mansion and they said to him, well, you know, you, we know you, you discovered, discovered the cipher, this script, and um, tell us, um, how did you do it? And Rawlinson said, I remember, or something like that. And this was not just a noise, it was true. Why? Because he didn't do it. And he has gone down in history instead of my Hinks as the hero who did this. He climbed a mountain, he copied inscriptions, he ran off with wild Kurdish boys, he went to Afghanistan, he did all that stuff, and he dined out on it for the rest of his life, and he tried to stifle and squash down poor Hinks for his own benefit. And this is what happened. Layard, who knew that Hinks was a better scholar than Rawlinson, gave him texts on the quiet to decipher, and by Jove he did. And in the end, he was brought to the British Museum for a few months to do some work on some of our inscriptions, which he did. And he made amazing leaps forward, this direction and that direction, but all right, and discovered all sorts of marvellous stuff. And then he had to go back to Killile, where he was the rector with his four daughters, and pick up his normal clerical duties. Whereupon... Rawlinson sneaked into the museum and read all the notes 
that he had written, because the museum has this fun idea, which I run into myself, and so have other curators. That is to say, work done on the premises, any day of the year, night, or morning, or evening, or breakfast time, belongs to the trustees. <laughs> okay? Now, if you make a discovery that has no fucking commercial value, nobody cares, but you find out something that might sell in the shop, they're all over you with a whole load of lawyers. So, this is what happened. This is exactly what happened. Rawlinson read all these notes and, aha, he said, and words to that effect. And he went home and rewrote all his stuff and published it with a complete vault fuss about how it all worked without ever giving any credit to poor old Hinks. I love this. I see what you mean about the museum. It's a great place. <laughs> One thing I have to tell you, this Tiglath Blazer the first, obviously, as you will see, um, cylinder buried in the ground by the Assyrian kings. There was a time in Britain when the people who ran everything, the intelligentsia in Oxford and Cambridge, who were, of course, up to their neck in Latin and Greek, didn't like all this stuff. They thought it was barbaric. They didn't want to have to learn foreign names, let alone a foreign writing system or anything like that. So they poo-pooed it, and they said that the so-called decipherment was a load of nonsense, and it wasn't true. And so what happened is the Royal Asiatic Society, who were always there to have a good giggle, as you know, decided they would have a copy made of this inscription and distributed to four of the leading scholars under plain wrapping uh, for them to work on it for three months. And uh, Rawlinson was one, and so was Hinks. And the interesting thing is this, that they had this time to prepare a translation of the text, which was then opened by the Archbishop of Canterbury and other worthies, and they looked at it and said, yes, indeed, this is um, true, you have deciphered it. And so by that time, near the end of Hinks's life, there was a bit more recognition that he was one of the great four, although I have a feeling that probably Rawlinson looked over his shoulder. Anyway, my view is that Hinks has been served a bad a deal by history. This is one of those, I think you often agree with me here, one of those blue plaques. And um, <laughs> it's really quite a nice one. And I discovered it when I dragged my wife, and when we were in Northern Ireland once, to Killalay, where this church where he was the minister and the house that he lived in was still there, um, in order to bow down and do obeisance in front of it and make a small statue and that kind of thing, not to mention sacrificing the odd pig. And um, I wasn't quite sure whether this was Hinks's actual um, house, until I noticed that right down at ankle level in the shrubbery, where any dog could read it conveniently, was this <laughs> blue plaque. And what did this blue plaque say? Did it say he was a fucking genius? Not a clue about it. Did it say he discovered the three of the dead, dead languages of antiquity and made them intelligible to the modern world, opening a whole new vista on knowledge from day one onwards? No! <laughs> Did they say he was tall and handsome? Or that he was a successful um, humorist around the poverty-stricken families of Britain? No. All they did is say that he was the rector of Killalay, and since it was the rectory in Killalay, that was not the main point. So this... <laughs> annoys me very substantially. <laughs> now, I presume you've all read my marvellous book, The Art Before Noah, and um, <laughs> generally speaking, have two or three copies lying around the house in different rooms. If you've read it with the attention it deserves, you will see that I seize the opportunity, fired up by this strong emotion as I am, to defend Hinks in print. And I wrote in a rather facetious way, perhaps, that Hinks was one of those people in the world whose discoveries were never attributed to him, and went on to say that, in fact, I have a feeling that in the whole history of the world from the beginning of time that the people who are written in history books as being the discoverers or the inventors never, ever are. That is my thesis. So just as a man has to be proved to be guilty before you can hang him, in my opinion, anybody who claims to be an inventor has to really, really prove it. So I said that Hinks's name was besmirched by history and Rawlinson, and he really ought to be a household name. Now, repeat that, household name, because that is what this whole lamentable evening is about, <laughs> is household names. 
And I said that he, that he ought to be on fridge magnets and, 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 um, and, and postage stamps. When I'm king, I said, I implied, when I'm king, uh, this will be um, immediately arranged. Well, um, this book came out to international success, as I outlined before. And um, uh, some months later, I had a, a, a letter from somebody in Northern Ireland who was in charge of their postal service. They don't seem to realise in Northern Ireland that the postal service is finished, because those of us who live here know that um, it, the postal service is doomed, but they're still soldiering on. And he said that, um, he said that, um, that they agree with me that um, there really ought to be a postage stamp um, with Edward Hinks's portrait on. So I'm humming and hawing which of the ones I've shown you this evening might be the most appropriate. <laughs> But all I can say, it is a very stimulating thing for a man who works in the dull and tedious back, back rooms of an institution like this, hunting for small, trivial details that nobody would ever care about in the world, <laughs> suddenly to find oneself an agent in one case of redressing the balance, and that sooner or later these stamps will be um, printed and available in your post office. I made one suggestion that they should be four foot square, and... <laughs> They're thinking it over. They didn't commit themselves. So anyway, I leave, you, I leave you with this final point, that, that of the material which has been presented to you this evening for consideration, <laughs> I would just like to say that, um, as a historian, of course, that absolutely every single thing I've said has been 100% true. And I hope that won't disappoint you. I hope it won't spoil the evening, because that's never affected anybody else here. So, I'm standing up to be identified. So remember, Hinks, household name. Thank you. So there you have it, Edwin Hinks. By the way, despite the crowd being on side for that, Evan Finkel did not win the Z List Dead List live at the British Museum. No, Sebastian Snow was the winner of that, not Edward Hinks. So... Well done, Dan Schreiber. If you want to listen to Dan Schreiber's talk on Sebastian Snow, please do uh, check out an earlier episode. I think it's called Have Briefcase Will Travel, that one. It's a good episode. And Dan Schreiber, obviously, is also um, part of the podcast No Such Thing As A Fish. So, yeah, they're, they're in Australia at the moment. Instagram's amazing. So, yeah, if you want to check out my Instagram, I'm also at I-S-Z-I underscore L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E. I spell Izzy like that because I basically bought Izzy.com when I was um, a teenager. Four-letter website, aren't I cool? Anyway, I hope you guys are good. Um, if you want to contact me for any reason, uh, please do through social media on Facebook. And if you're one of these Luddites that just goes, no, I refuse to be part of social media, media you can email deadlist at hotmail.co.uk deadlist at hotmail.co.uk anyway i hope you are enjoying the summer and if you are in australia i hope you are enjoying the cooling down period yeah i will try and get more out but like i say do check out making history on radio 4 do check out the british museum member cast We've got Julia Farley. If you remember, she did that episode about Carter Mandua. I'm currently editing her episode um, for release at the end of this month. So that should be an excellent one. If you like your Iron Age people, <clears throat> and who doesn't like Iron Age? She has been asked if they had metal in the Iron Age, uh, which amuses me. Please do get in touch. But until next time, adios. You've been listening to the Z List Dead List podcast with me, Izzy Lawrence. To find out more, please visit isiizzy.com. Ooh, and I'm being rung. And it's my friend Simon. And uh, he does a podcast with me called Seti Sopper. I hate him so much. Cheerio! Cheerio!